you. I want to welcome you to the Institute, of which I'm the chairman. I'm always told by our executive director that I have to tell you about our brochures. So I went and looked for them, and I didn't see them. But I'm told they're now outside. So if you want to learn about our activities, please take one. Um, I'm just going to open up this program of Yona. Yona usually starts. Yona, very modestly today, is only going to be in the third position. Um, Post-Europe's parliament elections. I think Yona means post the elections. But um, it's interesting, you know, many years ago de Gaulle said that Europe had an option. It might either become a United States of Europe or a United Europe of States. My hunch is that the latter is the best realistic possibility at this time. Uh, I'm not going to say anything about this topic. It's extremely broad. I think the speakers will define it as they proceed. I asked Yona what the significance was of the parenthesis. If you have the program, you'll see that beyond Europe, it talks about everything. And I guess Yona's point is that Europe, as it evolves, by that he means the individual members of the EU, the European countries, and the EU itself, it, has, it, 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 it evolves in a world of jihadists, of Ukraine, and everything else we read about every day. So uh, at this point, I'm going to turn things over to Mr. Fussfield, who will, if I, I don't believe in very long introductions, and the rest of you will be coming on one after the other. So maybe you'd say a word or two about yourself at, before you speak. Okay? Okay. And incidentally, there are bios in this, of course, in your folder. Uh, thank you, Professor Wallace, and uh, I, I would uh, refer you to my bio if, if you're interested, but uh, in, in any case, I, I'll say that I, I'm here representing B'nai B'rith International, uh, one of the uh, co-sponsors of, of this program, and we are a global uh, Jewish uh, advocacy and social service organization, and I, I'm serve uh, as their um, director of legislative affairs and also deputy director of their international center for human rights and, and public policy. And uh, I'd like to thank the organizers for the opportunity to involve B'nai B'rith in this very timely and important program. Uh, with respect to the title of the program, I, I you know, I think it's um, interesting that it leaves itself open to some interpretation. I'm prepared to, um, just by way of framing the topic, um, speak about uh, the post-election scenario. A post-Europe scenario um, might require more creativity and, and vision than I'm able to muster on a, on a Wednesday afternoon. But uh, in any event, um, B'nai B'rith, as, as I said, uh, is a Jewish advocacy and social service organization, and we, we have a presence in both the United States and Europe that dates back to the 1800s. And we follow developments throughout the European Union with great interest and great hope. With our deep roots in pre-war Europe and our current representation in Brussels and throughout contemporary Europe, B'nai B'rith has played an active role in advocating for the transatlantic partnership and for a, a strong European umbrella. The robust enlargement of the EU since 2004 is a highly welcome development, as is the EU's growth ever since the Treaty of Rome 57 years ago, as well as the enlargement of other vital multilateral organizations such as NATO, the OSCE, the Council of Europe, and the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance. Continued support for a vibrant transatlantic coalition is crucial as the sizable predicaments facing both Americans and Europeans will require increasing cooperation between governments and institutions on both sides of the ocean. There's no doubt that the growth of the European Union over the past decade has furthered the goal of, the, the broader goal of a peaceful, undivided, and democratic Europe. And with it, the spread of peace, stability, and respect for human rights and democratic principles, and the thought of 
war between uh, European countries has become a distant relic of the Cold War. But today, the, the current global financial crisis and the rise of Euroskeptics and extremists in the May parliamentary elections have raised questions about the future of a united Europe and the possible need to restructure European institutions. Many daunting obstacles lie ahead. The recent electoral success of extremist parties in a number of EU member states is of particular concern, with openly racist and xenophobic factions such as Hungary's Jobbik and Greece's Golden Dawn uh, making significant gains in the parliament. Indeed, Udo Vocht of the German neo-Nazi National Democratic Party, a man who has minimized the Holocaust and defended Hitler as a great man, has recently been named to the Parliament's Civil Liberties, Justice, and Home Affairs Committee, thus taking his place as one of the Parliament's guardians of human rights. While we do not yet know the extent to which these parties will be able to influence European policy, there's no question that their presence in the parliament has given them a prominent platform for disseminating their message of hatred. At a time when anti-Semitism and racism are already escalating across Europe, often in the form of violent incidents, a strong unified voice will be necessary to counter this disturbing trend. Incidents such as the one last week in the Parisian suburb of Sarcelles, France, in which anti-Israel protesters hurled a firebomb at a synagogue during an unauthorized demonstration, have become more frequent and are revealing the urgency of this human rights problem. Meanwhile, a striking array of international crises has emerged underscoring the need for active leadership by the transatlantic partnership. Last week's affirmation by the European Council of Ministers of Israel's right to defend itself from Hamas rocket attacks was encouraging. But as the war in Gaza continues indefinitely, how long is Europe's position likely to hold? And should there be a role in NATO, for NATO in that arena? Actions taken by the EU and the US yesterday to impose tough new sanctions on Russia in response to the Ukraine conflict represent an important breakthrough, but it followed months of hesitation. The downing of a Malaysia Airlines flight has drawn attention to the inability of Western countries until now to even provide a security perimeter that would allow a proper investigation of the crash to proceed. The rise of ISIS, whose supporters rallied in the streets of The Hague just last week chanting death to the Jews, and the reemergence of Al-Qaeda, which is helping to bankroll itself by kidnapping Europeans for ransom, as we saw on the front page of the New York Times this morning, have brought the struggle against radical extremists to European soil in a very immediate way. And finally, the specter of Iran's nuclear program continues to pose perhaps the greatest threat to international stability, fueling controversy over the agreement this month by the P5 plus one powers to extend negotiations till November. How Europe will navigate the unfolding changes to its own landscape and how the United States and Europe will come together to address the multitude of current dilemmas, even as European society and European institutions evolve, are topic ripe for today, topics ripe for today's discussion. We have a very distinguished panel of experts assembled here, and I look forward to an informative program and a spirited exchange of views. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Eric. Before, uh, you know, as moderator, I'm uh, 
going to to uh, <coughs> make a couple of footnotes before we uh, proceed. Um, I, I have an obligation uh, academically uh, first to um, <coughs> thank um, our co-sponsors uh, for their support. Uh, first and foremost here, Professor Don Wallace and uh, the International Law uh, Institute, <coughs> as well as um, our colleagues uh, across the river, uh, the uh, Potomac uh, Institute and the University of Virginia Law School, um, <coughs> who supported um, our work for a long time. And as far as the Bnebrit uh, uh, International, uh, no doubt is a uh, NGO, um, uh, actually, uh, if, if I may mention that uh, the Bnei Brit um, activity goes back uh, more than uh, 160 years or something like this? Uh, 171. Okay, I'm sorry about that. That's more than 160. <laughs> yeah, than yeah, that's okay, but it really uh, indicates their uh, long commitment to, to the issues of uh, human rights and so on. Before I introduce the next speaker, uh, Don Wallace asked me, uh, you know, uh, the laundry list that I had uh, on the initial uh, program uh, uh, mentioning a number of topics. Um, Eric actually surpassed that, and we have two dozen uh, challenges uh, all the way from the enlargement, uh, NATO, OECE, transatlantic democracy, the Cold War, the financial crisis, the elections, the European uh, Parliament, and the uh, radicalization of some of the parties, obviously, and uh, then, uh, then dealing with um, um, radicalism and extremism, the anti-Semitism, uh, the Gaza um, now crisis, the Ukraine, the Malaysian airline, ISIS, Al-Qaeda, the jihadist uh, fighters, and then, of course, the nuclear ambitions of Iran. These are uh, really some, some of the uh, uh, issues that uh, we were going to uh, deal with uh, in our uh, discussion. Now, before, before we move on, uh, again, as uh, an academic, I, I must uh, really mention that uh, without uh, with these uh, issues, many of these issues, uh, for for uh, decades uh, in the, most of the European uh, countries. I'm not going to list all, all our activities, but just to give you some sense that uh, the challenges are uh, actually uh, perpetual in a way. Uh, for example, in 1980, we had a seminar, a academic seminar in cooperation with European uh, institution in uh, Dubrovnik, um, and uh, actually we're supposed to deal with terrorism. We couldn't use even the term terrorism. We used violence uh, at at the time, and um, and so on, and many many other activities um, in many of the countries and capitals, uh, with Brussels and Geneva and Turkey and so on. Now I just want to uh, mention two two events just to give uh, some sense when we talk about the so-called post-election. It's not post-Europe. Europe is going to be there for a long, long, long time. Uh, two, two recent events uh, this month and last month that I participated, one in Romania on partnership for peace, uh, dealing with many of the challenges, not only the question of the art power, but the soft power, how to deal with many of these issues. And another uh, conference in Athens, in Greece, dealing with intelligence and the challenges, security challenges in the Mediterranean. So again, uh, we discussed these issues for decades. We discussed these issues also with the diplomatic community right here uh, in Washington and almost all the countries uh, in the region, in the European region participated in our activities. Uh, now, again, as academics, uh, we, we have a responsibility and obligation, number one, to learn the lessons of history, 
uh, what worked, what didn't work, and secondly, to anticipate the future. So we have a number of publications focusing on European concerns. For example, a couple of the journals in the Cold War, the uh, journal dealing with political communication, persuasion, psychological warfare, propaganda. After the collapse of Soviet Union, we are focusing on minority and group rights, ethnic, racial, religious, and national minorities, and we see now the issue in the Ukraine, which we're going to deal with. And finally, the Partnership for Peace, the NATO journal, uh, meaning to mobilize the international community, how to advance the cause of peace uh, with justice, and uh, the Ukraine is one of the major challenges, Gaza is another one, Iraq and Iran, and so on and so forth. So uh, again, the academic community tried to do whatever it could to deal with that. Now, I'm not going to spend more time except, I think, to mention that Europe, like any other region in the world, is uh, really uh, challenged by two uh, major, I think, concerns. Uh, one, the natural disasters, um, mother nature, and so on, that's one. And secondly, of course, man-made uh, disasters. Uh, Eric mentioned already the financial, I like to mention the technological, in other words, the cyber crime and uh, terrorism and war in general. So we, we have a long list of concerns whether it is uh, energy security, aviation security, maritime security, infrastructure security, and so on and, and so forth. We still have to be concerned about terrorism um, in, in Europe. And in fact, in July, it's the uh, anniversary, the ninth anniversary of the Al-Qaeda attack in London, the transportation system, as we remember. And uh, then the most uh, recent uh, attack uh, two years ago in Bulgaria uh, against the uh, Israeli tourists uh, through the activities of the, the Hezbollah at the time. So what, what is it? What are we going to discuss? In my view, I think we have to look at the two schools of thought. One, one is really uh, a pessimistic view uh, in fact, we just marked the 100th anniversary of World War I, the war that's supposed to end all wars. And uh, we also are discussing the Second World War and the, the Cold War and the Balkan conflicts and now Ukraine and the role of NATO from regional to global security, I think, uh, provider. So we have to deal with all these issues. In other words, it's grim because the wise always dreams about peace, but uh, the history of Europe is of conflict and war. And uh, again, we have to look at the situation now. The other school of thought, of course, is the optimistic, as Dan mentioned in terms of the unity of, um, of Europe, democracy, and uh, so forth. So I, I think we have to ask ourselves what direction, which direction, quo vadis, uh, that Europe is going to take in the coming months and years in light of the uh, recent elections to, to the parliament. It's only one of the indicators and the many challenges that we have. So to provide some sort of framework to this uh, today, uh, we are very fortunate to have a very rich, I think, panel. Uh, the first um, panel speaker is Dr. Robert Pollard, who is a senior foreign service uh, officer with uh, some 30 years of experience in Europe and in Asia and elsewhere. Currently is a visiting State Department fellow at the Europe program at CSIS, the Center for strategic and international studies. And we uh, ask him to provide some framework, some context to our discussion today. 
you have copies of the bio, so you can look at this. And um, uh, obviously, we are very honored to have him and the other members of the panel. And uh, then after each one will uh, speak for a while, uh, we are going to develop some discussion. Mr. Pollock, please. Thank you, Yona. I'm very pleased to be here. Um, I'm not going to go over my bio, but I'll just mention a couple relevant details. One is that uh, I served most recently abroad as the head of the economics section at the U.S. mission to the EU in Brussels. So I have, have some background on the EU there, and also previously in Berlin, same kind of job, heading up the economics section in Berlin, working on issues like the Eurozone crisis, data privacy, the trade uh, negotiations with the EU and sanctions against Iran, among many other issues. And as a good State Department um, representative, I'm supposed to say right up front that uh, I'm speaking in my personal capacity, and all the views that I express here are entirely my own. Thank you for that. So I'm uh, very fortunate, along with the other mem members of the panel, um, I know Jeffrey Harris and uh, I, he'll, he'll be able to correct all, any errors I make uh, in my, my uh, presentation, but I think I'm going to deliberately try to juxtapose one position against the position that I think Jeffrey may be taking. And, uh, you know, I, I should tell you that we, we know each other privately and uh, we actually get along very well, but in the, in the interest of uh, having a lively debate, I'll try to, you know, harden the position one way or the other. My thesis says, <coughs> is that the May parliamentary elections in Europe changed the political landscape in Europe in discreet but significant ways. It shook the establishment parties, and it will slow European integration. Now, if you're a normal person, <coughs> you don't know a lot about these elections, so I'm just going to tell you a couple of real fast facts, and then I'll go into greater depth. There's 28 countries in the EU. Uh, there was open voting in, in all these countries. Uh, participation, about 43 percent, about where it was last time. Every five years, there are these elections. These are not a national elections. These are for the parliament. And then after the parliament is, uh, is, is chosen, there's a process for selecting the next president of the, of the EU Commission, which is like the executive of the, of the EU in, in Brussels, and also a, what they call the council president, who's the person who is the chairman of the group of heads of states who come together approx approximately every month in uh, Brussels to make major decisions, including on issues that you care about. So that's just a quick, uh, easy background. Anyway, in this, in this election, in several countries, there was a strong showing of populist national movements, as Eric pointed out. And you could say that this signaled the erosion of some of the governing political co coalitions in certain countries and a growing fragmentation of the political spectrum. The election also did little to narrow what is the so-called democratic deficit in the European Union. That is the sense of people that, as you may have some, you know, uh, we often hear about Washington, that Brussels does not represent the man in the street, man and woman in the street. In fact, the new convoluted system to choose the EU Commission president, which I'll talk about in a minute, which is the most powerful job in Brussels, may actually increase popular disillusionment with the EU. After promising to increase popular participation, the selection process gave way to traditional backroom maneuvering among the member states that produced a competent but shall we say, uninspiring new president, and a deadlock on the other most important <coughs> jobs in Brussels, which are the council president, the high representative, which is the foreign minister, uh, the Eurozone chair, and the very important commissioner um, positions, which are like the cabinet in our, in our system. Furthermore, the European Council 
in, in, uh, met in mid-July and was supposed to come up with some decisions on those jobs. Well, it deadlocked, indicating some of the, the uh, results of the election, and it will not meet again until August 30th. So that means that the next College of Commissioners, the guys who run Brussels, who run the EU, will not actually take office possibly as late as November, which is a month later than expected. So you could say it's something of a lame duck government for six months. Now I, I you know, hasten to add that uh, to their credit, the system still works. The, you know, the, the EU government still functions. The bureaucracy is still there. The Commission still cranks out new regulations. It negotiates trade agreements uh, with the United States. The European Court of Justice uh, issues rulings on data privacy. The European External Action Service, which is their foreign ministry, seeks to help the new Ukrainian government. And the European Central Bank works to stimulate growth with easy monetary policy. So the system keeps working, but it's hard to have any new initiatives, for example, to come to closure on some of the tough issues in the trade negotiations with the U.S. without the new commission in place. And one of the main obstacles and peculiarities of the EU system is that they have uh, an informal set of quotas, a system of quotas to determine who gets to run the place. And those, are, those quotas are based on party, on country and region, and gender. For example, the quota of the system at least initially determined that the next high rep, the foreign minister, should be a socialist, preferably from a southern country and preferably a woman. So it produced the Italian foreign minister, Federica Mogherini, although she had relatively little experience and she had made an unfortunate decision early in her term to meet with Mr. Putin just as he was launching a, an offensive in eastern Ukraine. So I don't know, um, Jeffrey may know more than, than, than I, but I, I suspect her candidacy is now in trouble. But in any case, that just gives you an idea of some of the dynamics of, this, of, the, um, of uh, the system. I'm just going to tell you up front some, some shorthand uh, thoughts about the implications for the United States of these elections before I go into the greater detail on them. Um, I would say that, first of all, you're likely to have, and you already do have, a temporary slowdown in the pace of the negotiations of what's called the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, the TTIP, which is a very large, comprehensive, and important uh, agreement, which uh, many people believe that uh, will underpin and strengthen the Transatlantic Alliance if, uh, if it, is, it, it succeeds. You'll have greater parliamentary scrutiny of sensitive topics within those negotiations of things like data privacy, foreign investment, food safety, and the like. Also, you'll have a possible deceleration of the momentum behind banking union, which is one of the things that's supposed to prevent another financial crisis. Um, by the way, there's an ongoing uh, challenge in the German Constitutional Court on this right now. You'll have probably looser f fiscal discipline than you've had, a little less austerity, uh, and continued stalemate on important single market initiatives. You'll have tougher measure measures to discourage immigration, both in external immigration from, from the outside of the EU and internal migration within the EU. And on balance, I would argue, a Europe that remains economically weak and politically more fragmented than we would like. Now, I would, should point out, I, I wrote a, a piece on this just, uh, you know, in June, and already since then some things have changed. And the, the noteworthy event that, you know, Eric has already mentioned is that uh, because of this tragedy of this Malaysian airliner, um, that has prompted, triggered a, a vigorous European response in the form of tough sanctions against Russia. I have to say it came as a very pleasant uh, surprise. And, um, so it shows that the system can work sometimes. Uh, it did take, though, that airline disaster to get Europe mo moving. Uh, but there were some very tough financial measures that should have a significant impact. And that happened despite this deadlock over who's going to be the foreign minister. Because member states like Germany, France, the UK, and of course the Netherlands, which had the most of the victims, s decided enough was enough and decided to punish Putin. Now, 
this may be a little far afield from you know the the centerpiece of your of your uh, your studies, but I should just mention that uh, this episode confirms that the European External Action Service, their foreign ministry, will remain a secondary instrument of foreign policy in Europe. That after the member states. Basically, when it's an exist existential issue like the Eurozone or uh, national security issues, the member states still trump the EU. So what happened in that election? It was a protest vote. Um, both the French prime, prime minister and, and others called it a political earthquake. These, these elections shook governments in many of the EU's 28 member states. It was a harbinger of what is to come in their own national elections, for example, in the UK. Eurosceptic and anti-establishment parties won over one-fifth of the 751 seats in the European Parliament. And they took the top billing in the UK, in France, Denmark, and Greece. By the way, just a footnote, um, the Greek awakening did not do nearly as well as expected. and. Um, the, uh, the, the French party, read, led by Marine Le Pen, was unable to form a, uh, a, a coalition within the parliament. You throw in the European Conservatives and Re Reformists, that's a, a group that was created by a breakaway a group of uh, British um, conservatives, and now has people from, a lot of other people from other countries. They're stern critics of Brussels. Well, if you, you then could say the Eurosceptics have as much as a third of the European Parliament. I'm sure Jeffrey will emphasize this point as well, though. The establishment parties still remain in control. Um, even though um, uh, it, it was the biggest loser numerically, the center-right European People's Party, uh, which would represent the same party as Angela Merkel, for example, uh, ended up with 221 seats. And other mainstream parties, like the Socialists and Democrats, um, the centrist alliance of liberals and, Demo uh, and, and Democrats for Europe, and the Greens, which are all sort of establishment parties, um, they lost seats, but they still, uh, there's enough votes just between the conservatives and the socialists to form a coalition going forward. There were three specific issues in the elections that captured people's attention, dominated the debate, and those were the Eurozone crisis, unemployment, and immigration. But even though you could say that those issues were common to the debate in many countries, the policy message was not always <coughs> crystal clear, just like in the United States. For example, the protest vote against the EU's handling of the financial crisis meant one thing for creditor countries like Germany, Finland, and the Netherlands, where sentiment against the rescue of the debtor countries ran deep. And quite another thing in Greece and Spain, where many citizens blamed Ru Brussels' austerity medicine, medicine for worsening their economic situation. Likewise, concerns over unemployment elicited different policy solutions in the various member states. Now, the message on immigration was clear, um, although not a very positive one. Many voters want to restrict immigration from both outside and more controversially, uh, given its, its, its charter, within the EU. But I would argue that the central message coming out of the election, the most important uh, result, was growing popular discontent with the concept of more Europe. That is the growing concentration of political power in Brussels. For many years, voters have complained about the growing clout of EU institutions, which some critics have disparaged as profoundly undemocratic. Not anti-democratic, but undemocratic. Indeed, voters from France and the Netherlands, which are two of the founding states, the original six of the, of the European community, uh, had decisively rejected a proposed constitution for Europe in a 2005 referendum. And Ireland subsequently had to be coaxed twice to vote just to support a more watered-down Treaty of Lisbon 
in 2009. Now, even the reforms under that treaty, which, was, which were supposed to improve democratic legitimacy by giving more authority to the directly elected European Parliament, did little to assuage popular indignation. The way people see it is that the unelected bureaucrats in Brussels still draft and shape legislation over everything from financial regulations and industrial standards to trade and city citizenship policies while the citizens from the constituent states have to foot the bill. Sounds fami familiar, right? Now, you know, the, it's important to remember when we're talking about, you know, the importance of the unity of Europe from our perspective is that modern, modern day Europe has been a success. You know, there have not been wars uh, except at the periphery for over 50 years. And there has been unparalleled prosperity. And so long as the Brussels bureaucracy appeared to deliver the goods, this peace, prosperity, and jobs, voter discontent simmered, simmered beneath the surface, showing up only occasionally in squabbles on, over things like agricultural subsidies and the like. That all changed with the financial crisis in 2008. So that's what you're seeing now. It's partly a result of several bad years in a row. And this year's election did not improve the situation, getting back to my main point. The first order of business was the choice of the next EU Commission president, the top job in Brussels. Remember, this is the person that President Obama uh, meets with along with the council president. It's a significant decision not just because the commission president is a powerful figure, but also because it will determine who the European Council, the elected heads of state, or the parliament will run Brussels. Now, with just 29% of the overall vote, the center-right conservatives, European People's Party, claim to have won the election, giving its candidate, former Luxembourg Prime Minister Jean-Claude Juncker, first claim to be the next commission president. But when you look at it, well, since only 43% of eligible voters took part in the election, Juncker actually received the indirect support. Remember, they were voting for parliament members, the indirect support of less than 13% of the electorate. Even in countries like Germany, where the, the new system was well known, only a tiny minority of citizens were apparently aware they were casting votes for one candidate or the other. So the point of all this is that none of the candidates <coughs> for commission president could by any stretch of the imagination be described as the people's choice. Nor could the European elections be said to have resolved Europe, Europe's democratic deficit. Now, for American observers, what matters is the quality of the leadership and the future direction Europe will take, not the process by which they reach that. And I know <clears throat> from, you know, a very legitimate point that many of my friends from the EU, point, uh, EU make is that, look, <clears throat> talking about democratic de uh, def deficits, look at the opinion polls on the popularity and trust in Congress. Uh, we have our own problems, and I'm not trying to say in any way that this system is necessarily inferior than to ours. I'm just saying, based on its own merits, it has not produced the result that was hoped for. To become, before it, become, it can become a more effective and regional and global actor, I would argue the EU needs a stronger democratic mandate and stronger leadership, and that will probably need to await another election. So I just wanted to give you the framework there of basically what the election said, give you some some things to think about, and then we can move on. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Robert, for uh, providing that uh, 
uh, context, which is so so important, and uh, people are asking why why should we uh, be concerned about the results of uh, of the uh, elections? Uh, when I was in Romania, by the way, somebody commented and he said, uh, "We really don't like. Uh, we're supposed to be Europeans, but I don't like the comment of one of the leaders um, in in the UK." extreme nationalist who said that those people that know that Romanians are going to be your next door neighbor should start worrying. And uh, when we talk about unity of uh, Europe, it's not exactly something that is uh, acceptable in different countries. But at any rate, uh, thank you very much, Robert, for that. We're going to move to a case study and I ask uh, Peter Rudik, who is the director of the Global Legal Research Center, the Law Library of uh, U.S. Congress, to, to address the uh, East European elections and particularly the case study of, uh, of the Ukraine, which is um, really a, a very major, I think, uh, challenge <coughs> today and considered probably one of the most uh, um, significant challenges in the post-Cold uh, War, or maybe the beginning of a new Cold War. At any rate, uh, Peter contributed a great deal to our academic legal work and published uh, extensively, and we're publishing um, his um, insights on the Sochi uh, Olympics uh, very soon and uh, he had extensive uh, academic uh, activities, for example, at the University of Chicago Law School, and uh, he provides uh, advice to U.S. Uh, Congress on this issue. Peter? Thank you, Professor Alexander, for your introduction. And uh, to follow my colleagues on the panel, I have to start with a disclaimer that as a federal employee, my agency, which is the Library of Congress, is not responsible for everything what I will say here. It is on my own. And uh, you, Dr. Alexander said I'm working for the Law Library of Congress, which has a mission to provide research on foreign comparative and international law to the US Congress and other branches of government. So all our specialists have jurisdictional responsibilities and cover individual countries. My jurisdictional responsibility includes former post-Soviet states and countries of Eastern Europe. That's why I thought it would be logical for me to assess uh, European Parliament election results in the Baltic states, which would ev strongly different to, from what the rest of the euro, how the rest of the Europe voted. So if we will look at the elections which are generally of assessed as victory of the Euro right wing Euroskeptics, Euro in the Baltic states the results had slightly different specifics. First, turn out of voters. It was much lower than in, in the rest of the Europe which is a good sign because usually people come to the polling places when they are not happy with uh, current politics. While the general turnout was about 42.6% in all over the continent, in the Baltic states it was about 30, 36 in Estonia. Of course, it is not uh, the minimum level as it was in the Czech Republic or in Slovakia, but it showed that uh, this election was not at the top of the priorities of the population. Second, the real action rate. It was also lower than in the rest of the Europe, which uh, shows some kind of trust to political establishment. And uh, governing parties in these countries won the elections, or representatives of these countries won the elections, and uh, joined the alliance of liberals and Democrats and the People's Party. So probably these countries demonstrate some kind of stability and social unity. And as all their representatives, for example, Anders Ensip, uh, former prime minister of Estonia, said, their priorities are security, 
energy financial regulations. Uh, NCIP said it is extremely important that all representatives in the European uh, Parliament understand security alike. And this is a really a, a huge problem for these uh, three small countries, especially in view of current Ukrainian events, even though they are NATO members, even though they are recipients of huge European Union assistance and programs uh, which involve them. And uh, they help somehow the European Union also invo being involved in receipt of uh, refugees, for example. They have difficult economic situation. Unemployment rate is approximately 12% in these countries. Estonia is slightly better. They, and of course, their military is not capable to defend uh, these countries. For example, in Latvia, the whole size of the national military force is approximately the company size level of about 3,000 people. There is, of course, National Guard. There is uh, 5,000 people, border troops. But definitely, it will be not enough to defend the country from another Russian aggression if it would happen. And of course, there are concerns. Would NATO defend these countries if something will happen? Also, there are internal problems uh, which affect national security, population decrease, non-integration of ethnic Russian population, uh, and uh, strong uh, affiliation of this uh, Russian ethnic population with the Russian Federation, which is watching Russian TV and is, uh, believes to everything what they see on uh, their TV screens and are ready to support Mr. Putin. So how to respond in view of this Russian aggression? Maybe example of how they behave in the European Parliament and what will be a good example. And probably they can become a good advocate of Ukraine in the European Parliament, which is uh, active in regard to Ukraine. Just. Uh, what, two weeks ago they passed a resolution, not very strong, but uh, condemning Russian activities, supporting Ukrainian government. They made gestures aimed at protecting Crimean Tatars, uh, an ethnic minority in the occupied Russian Crimea. They started to discuss whether a ban on arms sale to Russia needs to be imposed. Chairman of the Inter Foreign Affairs Committee of the European Parliament just recently recognized annexation of Crimea as an illegal action, even though he stopped short from recognizing uh, activities in Eastern Ukraine as terrorist activities and uh, from supporting uh, sending troops for, uh, to this area. A couple days ago, the Foreign Affairs Committee conducted debates with the Ukrainian foreign minister and uh, observers uh, from uh, support to the observers' missions from different international organizations is also an important. It's I an interesting fact, but uh, now Ukraine has its own representative in the European Parliament also. An Ukrainian citizen is sitting in the Parliament. It hap she, is, uh, she has a dual citizenship, Ukrainian and Hungarian, mm -hmm. Andrea Bochkor. She lives, however, she lives on the Ukrainian territory, which is uh, next to the Hungarian border. And because of the Hungarian election law, says the ethnic Hungarian population is Ukraine is allowed to vote in Hungarian elections. And she was elected. So what will they do? I, thought, I think that they can keep up the, the pressure. And it will be the best what they can do. Now, taking into account that Europe is weak, politically fragmented, as uh, my predecessor on this panel said. So probably they can continue to insist on withdrawal of troops from, the, from Ukraine, uh, insist on stopping occupation of Crimea. Uh, no business as usual shall be conducted with Russia until the Ukrainian border is restored. Sanctions uh, shall target uh, not just general industries or interest, but specific uh, businesses which are critical for the uh, Russian Federation. Probably, uh, and it was good that it started uh, the sectoral sanctions uh, yesterday in regard to the banks, but probably banks need to be forced to release uh, information on private accounts of Russian leaders and expose to Russian population how much money they took from the country to these foreign banks. 
Maybe such sanctions need to be expanded to members of the family of those who are now under these sanctions. Just this morning on radio, Larry Kudlow said that our federal treasury should start to sell Russian rubles, and that will be the dead blow to the Russian economy. And of course, energy measures. The, it, of course, it cannot be done in one day, but probably it is the direction which, uh, in which everybody should go. And pro definitely support the Ukrainian President Poroshenko plan, which uh, provides for security guarantees for all negotiators, humanitarian corridors, amnesty for those who laid down arms, release of hostages, removal of all illegal formations, creating a buffer zone along the border for six miles, disarmament in the region, and restoration of government institutions. They propose constitutional amendments, more involvement of local uh, territories in the nomination of governors, new administrative reform and creation of new <coughs> local self-government bodies, and probably support of this plan. Of course, this plan is not working and will not be working as long as Russia continues its policies because everything depends now on uh, Russian unwillingness to build uh, peace in the area. But probably these Russian policies force Ukrainian, form somehow Ukrainian foreign policy and approaches toward foreign policies by Ukrainian population because they can see what Russia can offer to them, what the European Union can of, uh, offer them, and uh, compare themselves with other countries, <coughs> neighboring countries, which were recently, relatively recently joined the European Union. For example, because for them, European Union is not just an institution. And they understand that probably economic and military assistance will not be strong enough to elevate them to the level they want. But it is a set of values which they want to follow and which they want to accept. So if we will compare just legislative activities which recently occurred in the Baltic states and in Russia, it will be a very obvious example of differences in, in everything. For example, Bal Estonia recently approved electronic e-residence, e which allows investors to get Estonian and then European citizenship and uh, be more active in uh, this country's affairs. There is legislation aimed at language protection passed in all these countries, and it is a huge problem for Ukraine. Uh, opening of the KGB archives. Just today, Ukraine, pub, pub, not Ukraine, in the Baltic states, KGB archives are open and they started to do some kind of illustration process. And uh, today in Ukraine, KGB archives were opened in, uh, for those documents which uh, just a couple of days ago, Moscow court said no, says the uh, letters of Russian uh, government officials which were issued in the 1920s, 1930s cannot be shown to the public. Well, Ukraine shows them. Then expansion of civil rights, uh, even though, f as I said about the traditional values, Estonia, for example, they keep their on the law requirement that marriage is uh, <coughs> marriage between one man and one woman. They extend civil rights to cohabitating couples, trying to involve more people and integrate them. Economy, regarding economy, Bitcoin taxation. All these three countries just recently liberalized rules about Bitcoin exchanges and operation and uh, passed laws uh, providing for prosecution of those who deny Soviet or Hitler occupations. In Russia, at the same time, Bitcoins are almost completely banned and there was a recently a special statement saying that everybody who will uh, trade in bitcoins will be accused of money laundering. Restrictions are imposed on usage of internet, on uh, sport fan behavior. Dual citizenship is now a punishable offense and uh, people can uh, be prosecuted for having and not reporting their second citizenship. 
and uh, just look what uh, people, uh, what uh, the current, uh, what the Russian State Duma, lower house of the legislature, wanted to pass, and everybody just uh, had a sigh of uh, relief when they went on uh, summer recess without passing these laws. They wanted to ban video games if Russians are losing in these games. <laughs> they wanted to pro uh, prohibit uh, women to use shoes on high heels. Lim uh, they wanted to limit foreign movies, prohibit advertisement of scorchery and uh, different uh, healers and medics, F prohibit advertisement of fast food, food which contains genetically modified organism, and uh, ban using of Wi-Fi or having Wi-Fi in places of mass gatherings. And of course, ban on tobacco products for women under 40. Under 40, just for uh, claiming that it will help national health. What does Ukraine in regard to their legislation? Of course, the situation is very difficult, but they try to do at least some minor improvements, especially since uh, February when uh, new government came to power. So they started military reform. They passed a number of uh, le laws which channel more funds to their army, which was uh, not receiving almost any funds for the several uh, last years. They created National Guard. They Now they are uh, amending tax legislation. They are trying to pass a new fuel law, which will regulate access to gas and uh, other energy resources. Austerity program was passed in March, which provides for serious <coughs> econ uh, economic cuts. And there is an interesting legislation regarding illustration. It's doubtful that it will help because it is only applies to judges, judges and only those who have worked on cases related to prosecution of the protesters during this mass protest in November and from November to March. And it provides for special administrative review of judges' decisions. On one side, it is a kind of intervention into judicial independence and uh, a kind of outside review of what judges are doing. But at the same, what? I'm trying to find in my mind the link between what you're talking about and the European Parliament election. Because uh, many, you rightly pointed out, you mentioned all the discussions in the European Parliament about sanctions, about yes. uh, the debate last week, the inner workings of Ukraine, which are extremely important Well, my point is that probably now, coming back to the topic of European Parliament elections, we can see that, we can think that major international players, including specific countries, organization, and institutions, will show that they, uh, they need to show that they are serious about finding solutions to ongoing conflicts and secure global order without tolerating empty promises and lies of the world hooligans. And the European Parliament, which was for the first time elected under a new Lisbon Treaty, has now more authority than before, will have probably an important role in this process, or should have this role. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Peter. Uh, obviously, the, the issue of the Ukraine um, will um, be with us for a long time. B by the way, Sharon, do, do we have a map of, uh, if you can put, put it on so it would be <laughs> right, um, about the so-called uh, minorities, uh, as I said before, I think one of the consideration is the ethnic um, and uh, national minorities uh, issue uh, in Europe that uh, does trigger that violent uh, war. And war, of course, triggers uh, terrorism and violence. But at any rate, 
we'll come back to it. Now, I thought it would be very useful to see the forest and not only the trees, meaning that in addition to what's going on in Europe itself or in the uh, areas around Europe, the Middle East, um, for example, and uh, the um, ongoing uh, <coughs> situation in uh, Syria, in Iraq, and the Gaza, and so on. But uh, we, we have to see the broader picture, also the European interests and concerns uh, in Asia. And uh, we are very uh, fortunate uh, to have uh, with us uh, an expert on that particular uh, region, um, uh, Professor Amit Kumar, who um, taught uh, many universities in this country and uh, abroad, educated initially in uh, India, and uh, received his PhD at American, and I'm very glad that he contributed to our work. Uh, last year, for example, he contributed to our report on uh, Hezbollah, the global network, and currently is uh, preparing uh, research on South uh, Asia that we're going to publish uh, very shortly. Dr. Kumar, would you kindly come up here? I'd like to start by thanking uh, you and I and Don and, uh, uh, for inviting me and such a great panel of uh, uh, very distinguished diplomats uh, and academics and policymakers and so on. Um, I'm going to try to look from the standpoint of not just a European, but an Asian looking westwards, not just European looking eastwards. So I have kind of an important task here. Um, and also I'm going to concentrate more on the security policy, um, which includes counterterrorism and ISIS and so on and so forth. Uh, firstly, uh, in a nutshell, about the impact of the elections to the European Parliament, as far as the uh, common security and defense policy concerns, my sense is that it won't be marked, it won't change much. Uh, because the Eurosceptics have grown slightly in numbers, but the uh, pro-Euro guys are still strong. They have a, quite a huge majority. Um, my first question is, do all European countries speak the same language when it comes to foreign policy and, and, uh, and counterterrorism and security issues? Look at Germany's descent on Iraq um, uh, as far as the Gulf War was concerned. The Spaniards leaving uh, the coalition in Iraq after the Madrid bombings. Um, the, the Germany's belated acceptance of sanctions against Ukraine um, or uh, sanctions against Russia on the Ukraine issue. So uh, there are certain discordant noises we hear and it shows kind of a lack of a coherent uh, uh, foreign policy uh, and a security policy on all matters, I would add. Um, uh, secondly, does Europe have its independent stance in, in foreign affairs and security issues? Uh, for, for example, if you look at uh, the, the, uh, the uh, Gulf War um, or if you look at the uh, Iraq invasion, Afghanistan invasion, on some issues, for example, if you look at the NATO coalition uh, under the ISAF in Afghanistan, there, uh, Europeans joined large numbers, uh, comparatively speaking. But on other matters, they have their own views as well, as I mentioned earlier. Um, next, does Europe expect the US to do the heavy lifting as far as security and, and defense matters go? Um, or uh, does it have its independent stance as well uh, uh, to take charge of, of, of security issues? When you look at uh, the, um, the uh, uh, NATO issue, in Afghanistan, uh, or the OSC, which is again comprising both of European and non-European members, um, or, or other organizations like that, uh, uh, OECD and so on. Can Europeans take charge of defense matters on their own apart from the Americans or others? Uh, a very happy case in point is the success of the, uh, pro the project uh, or operation Atlanta where the Europeans have done a remarkable job in trying to patrol and curb uh, piracy off the coast of Somalia. So that is uh, definitely a great example. Um, now looking, looking eastward, 
which are the best avenues or vehicles and institutional mechanisms for, for Europe to engage in Asia? Uh, is it going to be the OSCE, which is pretty active in Central Asia, for example? Is it going to be the EU? Um, or is it going to be the uh, kind of not heard of much institutional mechanism called the ASEM or the ASEM, the Asia-Europe meeting, which has assumed increasing importance in recent years? Um, and, or is it going to be uh, EU um, and, 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 and second country, EU Asian engagement at the country level, for example, EU India, EU Japan, EU Malaysia, EU Asia? Or is it going to be EU's engagement with ASEAN, which has really assumed a lot of importance also over the last some years? Um, the next question I have is, how does Europe balance its trade and investment interests in Asia with its security concerns? For example, the, the, the action of the Germans and the English uh, and the French to engage China in, in, in defense ties, um, uh, whereas the EU still has an embargo post Tiananmen Square on China, shows that, that countries, leading countries in Europe may have an independent voice also. And they may like to uh, try to balance the security concerns with their commercial interests also. So that's, that's just a case in point. Um, can the EU and OECE strengthen capacity building in Central Asia? They're already doing it, uh, and especially with the spillover from what's happened in Afghanistan, there is a greater danger not only of terrorism in Central Asia, but also um, what the Europeans love to call the non-traditional security threats, uh, like drug trafficking, money laundering, uh, um, uh, terrorist financing, and so on and so forth. So a lot of capacity building has been done both by OSCE as well as the EU has really, uh, the EU coordinator was, was in Central Asia a few months back trying to uh, gauge the preparedness or the, the, the lack of, of, of capacity or the presence of sufficient capacity to deal with the uh, up, uh, upshot of the uh, NATO withdrawal from Afghanistan in terms of terrorism and other non-traditional security threats. Um, how, does, how does, again, uh, talking about Central Asia, how does Europe balance its concerns for democracy with those of human rights? If you look at most of the Central Asian republics, they're dictators and they tend to do away with the human rights uh, element, the rule of law, democracy, and so on. Uh, so you have a security interest of the EU. You may have commercial interests also because of the oil and gas richness of Central Asia, at least some of the countries like Turkmenistan. So how do you balance these concerns? Because they look like conflicting issues, and EU has to strike a very fine balance between them. Um, now, uh, coming down to EU and India, for example, the relationship has, has progressed quite a lot. There are institutional mechanisms. There are, uh, there's a constant dialogue every year almost. And with the new government in New Delhi, there's going to be even more clamor uh, for a stronger relationship, not only in the uh, commercial and the investment uh, level, but also in matters related to counterterrorism and intelligence information sharing, per se. Um, uh, because obviously, these issues are very important. From the standpoint of Asian countries in general, or Asia, they always have this ambivalence whether to deal with an institutional mechanism like an EU or to deal with countries one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, there is an independent uh, defense relationship with the UK, with the French, with the Germans, and so on. So there is this, this thing in the Asian mind, whom do I deal with? Because we haven't, uh, people in Asia are not that conversant with, with trading blocks or with regional groupings. So it's kind of a new thing from their standpoint. So they always pause and wonder, do we do business with EU or do we do business with the big countries in the EU, one on one? Um, uh, also, which is, which is the, the, uh, the uh, future, what's the future of the EU relationship with China, for example? Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, a few countries uh, went against the trade embargo includes, uh, uh, imposed by the EU on China when it came to defense ties. But in terms of balancing their interests in Asia, what is their stance on the South China Sea dispute? What's their stance on the East China Sea dispute? Do they side with Japan? Are they quiet? Are they saying enough? Is there enough posturing as far as their positions on, on these so-called discordant issues are concerned? Uh, do they uh, tow the non-Chinese line of the Philippines and the Vietnamese and the J Japanese? 
or do they uh, 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 kind of antagonize China, or don't they antagonize China? So, so these are balances that are that 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 from the EU standpoint are very important to strike. Um, I would uh, also uh, want to mention it's a very hot topic now uh, of the the uh, the ISIS phenomena. There is this talk about foreign fighters. Uh, uh, the threat of them, or actually some of them, like Mehdi Nemush, he perpetrated a dastardly act on the Jewish Museum in Brussels a few weeks back, uh, or a few months back, end of May, I think. Um, and then there are other uh, uh, possible things too, um, uh, threats that are real, threats that, that are in the pipeline. So that certainly calls for inspection as far as the EU is concerned. Is the Schengen information system functioning to its capacity? Are there drawbacks there? How can that be improved? For example, in the case of Mehdi Nemush, he was intercepted first by the Germans. And the Germans gave this information about him to the French, but the French didn't really transfer it to the Belgians. There's always this thing that, the, that these guys, the jihadis returned from ISIS, Syria, and Iraq may attack third states and not their home countries, as it happened in the case of Mehdi Nemush. And th this only calls, this is a clarion call really for seamless information sharing to the extent that we can have. Though I know it's difficult, we still don't have it here and in most countries, but obviously online, real-time information sharing, intelligence sharing is very important. And this hopefully, this realization of ISIS would really um, be, be, uh, be instrumental in, in, in greater efforts towards seamless information sharing. Um, now, um, when it comes to the, the, uh, the uh, Gaza issue, Hamas, for example, it's been heard and read that Hamas uh, trained ISIS in tunnel digging, for example. That's a trade that they learned from the Hezbollah guys. That's one thing. The other thing is you have, as I think Eric mentioned at the outset, uh, you have uh, all these uh, anti-Jewish gatherings uh, uh, in, in Europe, for example, at The Hague last week, where uh, ISIS, black ISIS flags were being uh, foisted also. So you have, you have this relationship between Hamas and Al-Qaeda which is becoming more prominent now. Many people don't go into it, obviously, thinking that Hamas is only a, a local question, a regional question. ISIS really is fueled by internationalizing, as Yona mentioned, the Hamas issue. Um, and that's one case in point. If you look at the identification of the targets, for example, and ISIS, Al-Qaeda-linked uh, Mehdi Nemush goes and attacks the Jewish Museum in Brussels. Um, and lashkar taiba terrorists go and attack the Chabad House in Mumbai. Um, eh, so there is this thing of, 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 of the mingling and the co-mingling of, of Hamas ideology with the Al-Qaeda ideology, which I think is an important striking development for all of us in the field to really look at. Um, obviously, one of the uh, things that I mentioned in terms of counterterrorism um, that's important is, uh, can um, uh, Europe at large uh, hook up the SIS I won't go into the technical details, but I'm not qualified to answer those. Hook, hook the, the SIS outside to friendly countries to get real-time information, for example, Jordan and Egypt and Israel and in India, uh, South Asia. Because there is this phenomena of, of terrorists being, being indoctrinated in one place, committing acts as a third place, and, and also the Indians are uh, quite, quite concerned about lashkar taiba terrorists and the Indian Mujahideen terrorists, or even an Al-Qaeda terrorist coming in from abroad and perpetrating acts in India. Uh, and they would love to have uh, the information sharing mechanism, as I'm sure the Israelis already do or may like to have, as well as the Jordanians and the Egyptians. We don't have too many friends in that part of the world, but obviously the few that we have, we should rely on them and build partnerships when it comes to information sharing. Um, I mentioned that the um, Asians generally are not very adept. They haven't really gone through the mill in the last 54 years or so. Uh, or 56 years that the EU has since its inception in 1958 to go through the experience of running and fomenting and, and establishing a trade bloc or a regional grouping. So in terms of the way EU has progressed politically, economically, demographically, commercially, that could have lessons for, for Asia, for example, for ASEAN, for the ASEM institutional mechanism, for SARC in South Asia. Um, uh, these are important lessons in terms of best practices 
that are really important. Um, um, I would I would I would also say that that uh, as far as the 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 Asians are concerned, um, they are um, obviously for example countries like the BRICS countries, uh, the Indians and the Chinese um, that are left out of the IMF, the World Bank milieu, and uh, and feel kind of uh, estranged from that because they don't get. Uh, uh, representation in, in the international financial bodies uh, commensurate with their economic growth, they're turning to BRICS mechanisms, for example, which is an important uh, 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 mechanism that does not include Europe, um, unless you include Russia as part of Europe, but, but that's another question, uh, given, yeah, given the reality. So uh, I guess whether it's BRICS or ASEM or SART, there's so much more that the um, Asians, the Indians and Chinese and the Japanese can learn from the, the successes of EU. Uh, it's going to be a quantum leap to think about a common security and defense policy for Asia, because given the, the diversity and the size of Asia and the competing ambitions of, of different countries and the lack of trust, which is very important, um, uh, that's kind of a constraint. But as far as the economic harmonization is concerned, as far as the free trade area is concerned, there could be lessons, if not for the whole of Asia, at least for, for the evolving trade blocks within Asia. Uh, thanks a lot. Thank you very much, uh, Amit, for uh, calling uh, our attention to uh, the situation um, in Asia. And of course, the question always is, uh, which Asia are you talking about? West Asia or Southeast Asia or the Far East and so on. But uh, you know, this was the, b the debate about uh, the um, Middle East, uh, what to call the Middle East or the nearest the State Department uh, Bureau and all that. But at any rate, um, I, I think we, we had some flavor uh, regarding some of the challenges uh, facing Europe in the uh, post-elections. And uh, now we're very fortunate to have really a, um, a true professional who worked on these issues for many years, uh, Jeffrey uh, Aris, who is deputy head of the European Parliament, liaison office with the US Congress, and formerly was the head of human rights unit within the Secretariat of General of the European Parliament, and uh, is dealing with these issues on a daily uh, basis and provides, uh, I think, um, guidance to um, the Euro European Parliament and the interparliamentary uh, relations of many of the countries in Europe. And I asked him to uh, try to point out some of his views on what was discussed uh, in light of the uh, European parliamentary elections. Mr. Harris, please. Well, thank you very much. Um, I don't know whether I'll leave you optimistic or pessimistic, but just to simplify things very clearly in your mind, because we've waged far and wide uh, in relation to the initial subject, there's a basic question, is whether we are living through the end of the West as a dominant cultural, political, economic force. Uh, and I don't use those words lightly. As a very old friend of mine who's been a professor at Oxford for the last uh, 25 years, started out as a Labour MP, rebelling against the party line and supporting uh, British membership of the European community in the early 1970s, a man called Professor Marquand, the book The End of the West. 
uh, and the subtitle is The Once and Future Europe. So if you want to know what I think uh, in a more elegant and brilliant way, read his book, because uh, although it's uh, published a couple of years ago, I did find that I was reading something uh, by somebody, uh, say, looking at the institutions from the outside, who really had understood uh, what, what, uh, what, what has gone on, and indeed what might go on if certain of the trends referred to uh, today uh, continue. Um, I actually quite like the title of this afternoon session because you have mixed everything up. Uh, and I think that's exactly as it should be. Clearly, the Ukraine crisis is influencing the events, even on the choice of the uh, people in high positions uh, in the, the European Union. Developments in the Middle East are playing into uh, a rise of anti-Semitism in uh, Western Europe, indeed in other parts of the world, which is deeply disturbing. Uh, indeed, if there was one emblematic event that you had to pick out to say well, what is going on in Europe today, you could probably write a novel or a book or a background uh, document or make a movie about the tragic bombing of the Jewish Museum in Brussels. That museum, I know it well, I know the guy who set it up. It's a couple of miles away where, from where I worked for 30 years, and the fact that somebody should bomb that is, of course, a horrendous act and a horrendous political message. That he should bomb it on the eve of the European elections makes you wonder whether people aren't more aware of what they're trying to tell us uh, than we might even imagine. Uh, more, the fact that he, if I understand it, is a returning from Syria or is linked to the groups of that kind really shows the dimensions of the challenges which we all face, European Union included. And whatever, uh, and I agree with uh, Bob, many of his observations about the political intrigue uh, which uh, takes place with regard to top positions in, in the European Union, whatever you say about that, I don't think you will find a great deal of complacency inside the European institutions at the present time. Oh, we've got Mr. Juncker, it's all going to be okay. We'll have some of say, you know, I think there's genuine concern about the prospects for maintaining of the European Union, the future enlargement in the immediate term. I think there, Jean-Claude Juncker is right. There won't be any further enlargement in the next five years. And of course, a lot boils down to the economy. But before we get too pessimistic, let's, let's give ourselves a bit of historical perspective, because I also think there's a big process of generational change taking place in Europe, which maybe also explains some of the, the phenomenon which, which we see. If we look back to Europe of 1945, uh, the European Union is a huge success. Europe uh, of the 500 million EU citizens is broadly speaking an economic, political, social success. Huge challenges, but a successful, peaceful uh, integration. There's a war going on on the borders of the European Union. There's been a war in the Balkans, in the Caucasus. There are tensions, uh, uh, ethnic tensions to some extent between Hungary and its neighbors because of some of the remarkable statements of the Prime Minister of Hungary, but within the European Union it has basically achieved its objective of democracy, human rights, rule of law, free elections. Now, free elections means you might not like the result. So uh, th I'll just make, make that point at the beginning. That is, it is basically a successful process, but it had always been a process racked by crisis. In 1951, they established the coal and steel community and they just established the Council of Europe. Three years later, the French Parliament voted down the European defense community, which at that time was considered an extremely important US-sponsored initiative uh, aimed at peace and in, uh, in the heart of the coldest period of the Cold War. That went awry, so uh, the leaders went for the European Economic Community. The British woke up and decided we would better join this, uh, and there were all these problems that De Gaulle veto, the empty chair, uh, all this kind of thing. Europe has been through crises, and I doesn't mean to be complacent, I don't think I'm a complacent, but I'm pretty too uncomplacent. But you know, there's nothing new about this in a complex, democratic, law-based political system where the people decide, the citizens vote, sometimes in referendum, and sometimes they'll vote uh, the way the, the elites don't appreciate. But even in 1989, which you might consider that's the triumph 
of our values. Yeah, end of the West, what are you talking about? 1989, Gorbachev started a reform process to try and save an unsavable Soviet Union. Uh, the, the system collapsed one by one. The countries established democratic systems, and one by one, slowly but surely, they joined uh, the European Union, which now has 28 member states. But even then, three years after 1989, uh, the Annus uh, Mirabilis, if you like, came 1992, Annus Horribilis, <laughs> with a huge economic crisis, Britain and the pound and the euro, or the whatever it was called at the time, and now the shambles of a British policy on Europe. But 1992 uh, was a really big uh, mess, and let's not overlook the fact, I mean, we'll talk a little bit about Britain, that the project of the euro, project can be debated, should it have been political union first, should the criteria have been more strongly enforced, but even that project, which was a French project designed to bring Germany into a joint leadership of the European Union on a stable basis, even that project was nearly voted down by the French people in a referendum. Not the British, the French. Yeah? Uh, so, so it's always a project which is challenged, indeed precisely because it is such an ambitious project, uh, one which is of great importance. I certainly agree with you as a kind of model for other regions of the world. It has to live through these, these challenges. Even the Le Pen phenomenon, the rise of the extreme right, it so happens, uh, you may know this, that I'd say it's a hobby, but uh, one of the subjects I studied during uh, uh, part of my professional career was the rise of the extreme right in Europe. Thirty years ago, Jean-Marie Le Pen had a brilliant score in the French uh, uh, European elections. These were the second European elections, so this is 1984. His daughter had a fairly brilliant score, and the prospects for the next presidential election in France are certainly very, very uh, worrying. But, you know, it's not entirely new. It doesn't mean it's okay, that's fine, oh, okay, Le Pen has got even more votes than her dad. You know, I'm not suggesting that for one minute, but it didn't just start with the, 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 the financial crisis, although clearly that has contributed uh, a, a great deal to it. Uh, in the 2002 elections, uh, Le Pen even got through to the second round. Uh, so, so, I mean, I'm not saying nothing new, forget it, it's not a problem. I'm just saying uh, uh, if we're going to get a perspective, we, we've got to be clear about where we're coming from, what we've already been through, and where we might be, be going. Reference was rightly made to the fact, and I think this was really a very revealing event, uh, it was Possibly, they blame it all on Tony Blair. Uh, he announced that there was going to be a referendum on the European Constitution, and the French and the Dutch thought, oh, well, we'll if there's going to be a referendum in Britain, we'll set the ball rolling. We'll have a referendum first, so that'll, you know, then the British will go along with it, because Tony, he's going to put his prestige on the line. It'll be okay. The French and the Dutch found a members of the European uh, Economic Community, Common Market, as it was originally called, voted it down. That was a sign. I don't say the elites ignored it. They didn't ignore it, but they c did not consider it sufficient reason to abandon the whole process, close it down, <laughs> leave the Union. They opted for the Lisbon Treaty, uh, uh, a, a, a sort of watered-down version of the Constitution without reducing, for example, you know, the number of member states in the European Commission, uh, without uh, 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 having a hymn and a flag and this kind of thing. But uh, so th th there are certain uh, uh, signs there of strain which have been there for quite some time. Just one point uh, uh, about uh, one of Bob's points about the elections being a harbinger of things to come. Could be, could be not. Politics can be a rather sordid business. If you're the leader of the opposition in Britain, the only thing you care about is the national election. Ed Miliband visited, uh, 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 visited Barack Obama uh, last week. He is sitting, according to opinion polls, on a 60 or 70 seat majority in the British Parliament. That's what he's there for. He's the leader of his party. You might say, and I would say, many of my friends who are MEPs say, he should have done more to mobilize the Labour voters in the European elections. He didn't care enough, yes, but he got his members, uh, some members elected, he got a few more seats. All he wanted was to be sure that the UKIP had enough space to irritate the Conservatives for the rest of their regime. <laughs> Mr. Cameron, not necessarily on the principle, but decided to have a fight about Mr. Juncker. Now he's uh, made his government uh, a little more Eurosceptic than it was a month ago because politics is a, 
always an evolving process. He's now further behind in the opinion polls than he was at the time of the European election. So these Harvey, Mr. Renzi, brilliant success in the Italian elections. Uh, let's see. I mean, I've noticed uh, how, we'll see how long he lasts, yeah, but uh, hopefully it will be a success. So, uh, 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 and what will happen in France, nobody can see. But, but certainly there is a right-wing extremism present in the European Parliament. If we have a European Parliament, it must be representative of the citizens. And if there are a large number, 20% of people who genuinely sympathize with such abhorrent ideas, in my view, if we believe in democracy, bring those ideas out into the open and let them see what this chap who will turn up, uh, I certainly understand what you say about the Civil Liberties Committee, the chairman himself, uh, Claude Moraes, has deplored this fact, but that is the, the way it works. Part of the European Parliament is for giving everybody the opportunity to express their, their opinions and to play their part. Let's see if they actually have any ideas to present. And, you could argue, uh, as, as an official of the parliament, I deal with all the members equally, it could be argued that those who take a position uh, such as Mrs. Le Pen and others will actually not have very much to contribute day by day in the European Parliament. UKIP itself has already uh, surged backwards in the opinion polls. I don't say they'll be forgotten about. Backwards. Yeah, <laughs> if, if that's possible. Uh, so, uh, I, uh, um, and, uh, you know, where they will be in the next election, let alone in the next European election, uh, w w which is so so far, so far ahead. So, so I mean, that is the way it works. If there are people who are beginning to think along the lines of racism, xenophobia, uh, it's better that we know they exist uh, uh, and that they are given the opportunity. We have the censorship exists. Uh, we have the opportunity to, you know, anti-Semitic statements, uh, denial of the Holocaust. Uh, there, are, there are laws which enable uh, parliamentarians' immunity to be suspended so they can be prosecuted. There was a Hungarian member from the last parliament, from the Jovic party, who was being investigated for being a Russian spy. Uh, who's, who's, I mean, so, so, I mean, and Le Pen himself, there have been many cases. I, I'm not being remotely complacent about it, but whether the elections are such a catastrophe and whether they represent a harbinger of things to come, I'm not quite so sure. Now, let's get on to this uh, issue of the, 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 the what happened after, the, the, first of all, the election campaign. The official view of the European Parliament uh, and its president, official uh, communication strategist, is that the t participation rate has not gone down much further. Well, any further, it was up slightly. So 43.1%, that's considered not too bad, although immediately as pointed out, uh, even by Mr. Barroso, I think, well, you know, but of course uh, there was a lot of mobilization by extreme right voters who were against the whole thing. Uh, that put the turnout up. But by taking part in the elections, they help to legitimize the process. So uh, you can't have it both ways. Stand for an institution, uh, get all the privileges and benefits of being a member and the prestige. Uh, so, so I mean, that, that I don't consider that that necessarily is a particularly uh, important argument. The election campaign, for the first time, because there is a line in the Lisbon Treaty which, which goes in the direction of uh, the elections being taken into account before the uh, European Council nominates somebody to be the president of the commission, uh, the election was a bit different. There were debates between the different candidates. Uh, it wasn't new that each party political family had a common program, but the, that they had a leading candidate. Uh, and uh, the way it unfolded uh, after the elections took many people by surprise. Indeed, there was a lot of positioning. Uh, it so happens that the dominant political figure in Europe today is quite clearly the Chancellor of Germany. She happens to come from the German Christian Democrats. They are part of the EPP. She had initially made it clear she didn't seem that keen on Mr. Juncker being the president. But then somehow, there's a, a complicated process which Bob and I have discussed, within the German political uh, establishment, because they have a coalition, they hit on a, an idea which suited those two parties uh, and the rest of the, the, the uh, European political families, particularly the Christian Democrats, the People's Party, the winning party. They were unanimously in favor of uh, um, uh, Mr. Juncker, with one exception, the Hungarians, who, who are actually still in the EPP, which is uh, rather special, uh, uh, but they all supported. The socialists had quite a lively debate, uh, uh, and uh, but uh, their leading candidate, Mr. Schulz, and 
some in the political parties in that family I said well we, we participated in this we didn't get as many votes as, as he did we should accept this it's an important constitutional development uh, and we'll have to see how that development takes place in the future but when it came even a few weeks later to a vote on Mr. Juncker's election he did get elected, he got 55% of the vote, but par members from two major parties within the socialist uh, group in the parliament, the British and the Spanish, opposition parties of course, uh, didn't vote for him. So I mean, it's, it's not like, I think to say, the whole establishment have just gone along with this and forgotten about uh, uh, the message of the elections possibly a bit exaggerated. We will see. Uh, but, um, you know, uh, the, the, sort of the campaign, the results, the procedure, the prospects now, uh, as Bob said, uh, it is a bit strange that they have appointed Mr. Uh, Juncker, uh, but they haven't made other key appointments. Uh, and that, uh, here in official capacity, you'd have to analyze that in terms of which parties and countries have benefited from that arrangement <laughs> because there will have to be a decision uh, later on and I think when, when this whole thing is analyzed uh, maybe uh, some people say well okay we agreed on Mr. Juncker but maybe we're a little bit quick uh, as a quid pro quo to say okay well we'll accept that Mr. Schultz be president of the parliament and then and then leave the rest separately but that's a question of negotiation which which historians and political observers uh, can analyze so uh, certainly the the European Parliament its members its officials its president uh, do not start this legislature or think oh well it's now now we're in charge of everything uh, we decide everything the, the whole institutional structure of the European Union is based on a sharing of power between the European Parliament and the member states the Council of Ministers of the the European Union. The Commission, a very important body. I would question whether the President of the Commission is the most important President of all the various Presidents around, but still the Commission, extremely important, uh, which is why we have this uh, whole arrangement. But the Commission proposes the laws. The Commission executes the laws. The laws are adopted broadly similar, slight exaggeration, but broadly similar to the U.S. system. We have the House of Representatives, namely the European Parliament, and we have the states, namely the Council of Ministers. And nothing gets adopted, no budget, no law, no uh, treaty with the United States, no accession of any future member states without both those bodies agreeing, sometimes by special uh, majority. So certainly the, the choice of Mr. Juncker, important, but again, in the political bargaining, uh, uh, people can, might be saying, well, yeah, we'll give them that and we can have this. Because actually, uh, you, know, you could argue foreign affairs, the external relations can be much more important in the years to come. So that's uh, just a, a personal uh, observation. So uh, let, let's not be complacent. As I say, I don't think that is the, the, the mood in Brussels at all. Uh, but uh, And indeed, uh, I would say with reference to one very important issue, uh, uh, which was clearly of great importance in the British elections, um, I find it extremely unlikely that of the 28, uh, any of them will leave by the time of the next European elections or the European elections after that not because I think the British people are particularly astute. I think, in fact, many British people of all parties were not very impressed by the way Mr. Juncker got his job. That's a British uh, view which is shared across a political consensus in Westminster. But the conclusion was that Mr. Cameron had made a, a hash of a good point. He had a good argument, but he made a mess of it by making empty threats, which then put everybody's back up uh, against him. And, and of course, the, the Labour opposition uh, uh, didn't agree with the system, but uh, it doesn't mean that they uh, consider this a reason to threaten to, to leave the whole thing. Uh, and I say, having been a member of the British Labour Party, which was initially for joining the first for you know first we were against then we were for we even organized as a government the first referendum then we lost to mrs thatcher and decided we were against the whole thing uh, then we uh, spent 20 years in opposition and came in with a more pro-european approach but the only part of the leadership were in favor of the euro so we're still in this sort of outside circle in relation uh, to the euro but uh, 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 the British Labour Party uh, has, is sticking with that particular position uh, of staying in the EU uh, there are liberals and the the circumstances which 
would lead to a real crisis in two or three years' time would be the election of a majority conservative government, um, uh, which would then be obliged to try and carry out its program of renegotiating the terms of British membership and then putting it to a... I'm not saying that's not going to happen, uh, but it's by no means obvious that uh, we're less than uh, nine months away from the British election, that there is an overwhelming feeling in Britain we have to get out of this. We don't love the EU, we've always been reluctant about it. Geography, you just need to look, don't you? you need to <laughs> uh, the history of Britain uh, leads, to, and unfortunately, a new generation of British people still seem to be unconvinced, but they're not convinced that it would be wiser to, to leave. So I think I've probably gone well beyond my time. Just a couple of points. As part of my job, I, I report back to the members on important developments, hearings, and this, and occasionally, uh, to make them think a little bit, I send them an interesting newspaper article. So I couldn't resist the temptation uh, yesterday morning uh, to send them Farid Zakaria, the EU, the great no-show on the world stage. Yeah? A very good and very convincing <laughs> argument on many points, although it came the day before uh, the decision. So I sent them a little update today that maybe in the judgment of Farid is perhaps not entirely uh, uh, valid a day later, but it's a stimulating article, except on one point, where he rightly says that the, the liberal international order is being challenged. That's perfectly obvious, whether it's uh, uh, President Putin, uh, whether it's China, even some of the BRICS, you know, clearly there are major challenges to the international liberal order. But then he seems to put the blame entirely onto Europe. And if I may say so, in Washington, D.C., I think another large country has its own share of actively undermining the respect for international law and human rights and uh, uh, issues of that kind. So that's a shared responsibility. And if we're going to turn around and get a more strong international liberal order, then, then uh, clearly the U.S. and the EU have to do some hard thinking. Now, is the U.K., is the Ukraine a game changer? It possibly is. Uh, it remains to be seen because it's an unfolding uh, series of events. Uh, and having you know, talked about uh, reference to the First World War, it's by no means clear where it is going. It would appear at this moment in time that Mr. Putin has not the slightest intention of stepping back. He sees a weak EU. So everything you say about the EU being a shambles, the elections being. That's fine. That just in oh, you see, <laughs> they can't even decide anything. You know, I mean, probably probably thinks this Italian lady is stupid. Quite honestly, he probably thinks, well, God, if she hadn't come and visited me the week before and said she was all in favour of South Stream, they probably would have just given her the job. I mean, talk about political tactics. But anyway, uh, it is less likely at this moment in time that somebody so blind to the dangers of Russia, uh, and if she is any more blind, she probably isn't blind anymore. No, in the meantime, Putin has revealed himself even more. So th there's a big uh, decision has to be made. Of course, a lot depends on Germany, where we know there's been a tradition of avoiding uh, conflict uh, with, with Russia and the huge investments. I don't think, I think this rather unseemly dispute between Britain and France you know, so who's more tough on the sanctions, as you mentioned, in relation to the arms embargo in China, which I think, in theory, Britain is in favour of, you know, even though they're <laughs> pushing the, these, uh, um, the, the, these arms uh, sales of different types of arms. Baroness Ashton did attempt to, to, f to credit to initiate some kind of discussion on this, but it does seem, you know, so many years after Tiananmen in a totally different uh, geopolitical environment, at least worth considering, but uh, nobody uh, took any, any, any notice. So. Uh, we probably are in a game-changing situation. Important to bear in mind, particularly if having time to go into all these issues of the extreme right, anti-Semitism, the active role of Russia, Russian companies, Russian media, Russian secret service in fomenting the extreme right in Western Europe. And you know, uh, I do continue uh, to find it a bit strange that the Prime Minister of Hungary should receive the endorsement of the EPP, whether that was maybe a few months ago, but uh, he actually announced himself yesterday that he was in favour of a illiberal constitution, so uh, how the EU is going to handle that. It has already been discussed in the Civil Liberties Committee, uh, and the majority of the Parliament did adopt a report extremely critical of Hungary. We'll have to see where, where that goes. But finally, just one point which is so obvious, and I haven't thought of it myself, and I'm not being patronizing towards you, but two people have mentioned this in Washington recently as actually being the fundamental political fact of the times we're living through, and that's the generational change. 
uh, Hillary Clinton mentioned in her, in her au revoir speech uh, in the Brookings. Uh, Steinmeier mentioned it in his uh, speech also that, you know, referring to his own daughter and how she sees Europe and this sort of thing. I think, you know, the fact is, I think of myself having been there, activist in favor of the Yes campaign in the 1975 referendum. The idea of another referendum, you know, that, that's democracy. If the British people feel that's what they want to do, uh, they'll do it. And they might vote yes, they might vote no. We'll see. But it, it's a new set of British people. I know that from talking to members of my family when, when I'm in Britain. And not only do they have, a de therefore, a different approach to European political issues, they have maybe a different historical memory. I mean, the basic argument, which I started with myself, look at what we achieved since 1945. Well, if I was addressing a group of 20-year-old students in Manchester or London, they might not be very impressed by this argument. Uh, they wouldn't think it, w it was uh, particularly uh, negative. So I don't think uh, America should be too, hopefully, uh, encouraged by our weakness. I, I wouldn't blame the president. I think he, he is a little disappointed, uh, in a sense, in the European Union, that he doesn't feel there's something strong that he, he can work with. Uh, a, a new generation of European leaders will, will have to emerge, and they have to convince an, uh, a new generation of Europeans uh, that the idea, which did inspire a fairly successful project, is worth continuing with. But as I say, if you come to Brussels or Strasbourg, you won't find uh, a particular degree of complacency. If you, at least if you let me show you around. Anyway, thank you very much for your thank attention. You thank you very much, uh, Mr. Harris, for your insightful uh, comments, uh, educating uh, all of us, and as we say, hopefully the next generation of leaders as well. If I may, let me ask you a question. Um, and, and perhaps some of the other panelists would like to jump on it. So actually, uh, two, two questions. Number one, uh, we spoke about the Ukraine. We spoke about separatism. Now, do you, do you see a trend um, developing, let's say, in Europe uh, in terms of all new separatist tendencies? Uh, for example, the old uh, tendency in Spain of uh, ETA to separate from Spain or Catalonia uh, or even in Britain, the Scotland, you know, movement for self-determination. And uh, even now there, there are reports about those who would like Venice <laughs> to separate from, from Italy. So number one, on the separatism uh, issue and whether, let's say, the impact of the elections have something to do with nationalistic, I, I think, tendencies. Uh, secondly, on the pessimism uh, issue that you, you raised, and this is two sides of the coin. One, do you think there is an impact, meaning, let's say, weakening of the soft power uh, approach to politics, by that I mean the value system to combat intolerance, let's say, and uh, violence and to promote human rights. I'm talking about internally. And secondly, externally, uh, do you think these elections are weakening the role of NATO from regional to global security concern, the new strategic concept? For example, now NATO is focusing on the Ukraine. Do you see a role for NATO to become involved, let's say, in Syria, or maybe in Gaza to disarm the Hamas? So I think these are some very critical questions that um, I think we, we have to ponder with great concern. You can speak maybe from, uh, from where you are, or you can come up here. Similarly, in Scotland, or it's nowhere uh, less called the terrorism to speak of, 
uh, 800 years after the Act of Union, uh, the Scottish people want to think again. The British Parliament has wrestled with the Scottish issue for a long time. Uh, the Conservative government has accepted the idea that there will be a referendum. The Scottish people will decide. Uh, and if they decide uh, that they do not wish to be part of the United Kingdom, that will be a decision taken today from the secret ballot. Uh, um, seems that they won't decide that. Uh, whether that will settle the issue uh, remains to be seen. But, but uh, clearly that there's an issue there. There are some British Conservatives, a small minority, which well, I mean, okay, if that's what they want to do, let them, uh, let them get on with it. Uh, because that's where Labour get half their members of the British Parliament. So, I mean, I think, you know, uh, I it may sound sort of slogan, but in some of these complex situations, maybe to get back to basics, it's not a bad idea. Uh, we're being critical about Czechoslovakia and the breakup of Czechoslovakia. Mm -hmm. yeah, regrettable uh, thing that it took place without a referendum, but clearly uh, with, 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 the, with the acceptance of, of, of the elected parliament of the two, two parts of, of, of the referendum. So, so then uh, I'm not sure that's a, a real major campaign. On the other issue about soft power internally and externally, I think that's a very rhetorical question, it is a question for the future. Certainly Russia, China, others, they use issues of racism, the European Union, so why are you keeping us out of running your own? We're not an SDI ourselves, that's a self-serving uh, argument, which has been confronted internally in the European Union and the member states have developed a number of means uh, with which to deal with Controversies that you see in the United States, I mentioned the whole NSA story, all about the role of counterterrorism, uh, even privacy, secret services. To be fair, there hasn't been such a huge controversy in any European country about this. Of course, in my country, Britain, there's a strong civil liberties lobby that criticized many aspects of issues of uh, uh, renditions and you know, by no means a brush under the table. But by and large, <coughs> same you know, picture of the secret state which is, uh, sometimes presents itself here in the United States, even to the members of Congress that they struggle to get reports <coughs> about their activities. Uh, you know, so, so we don't have any issue of spying on the House of Commons or uh, all this kind of thing. But, uh, as to whether or not uh, NATO is weaker or stronger, uh, let me say I would pass on that. Uh, I would very much hope that it's not weaker. Dr. Pollard, would you, would you like to make a comment on this or anything else? No, I, I guess oh, yeah. um, you're okay. Okay. Uh, sure. Um, basically, uh, it's a very interesting perspective from Jeffrey. Um, I would say there's a greater danger of a cocktail of ethnocentrism, uh, religious fundamentalism, uh, thanks to ISIS and its influence, um, and Al Qaeda's influence in Europe. Um, and crime uh, and separatism. So that heady cocktail would really undo a lot of the good that's been done in Europe um, till now. Um, as far as the European legal system is concerned, if we look at the European Court of Justice striking down Yassin al Qadi's listing on the UN al Qaeda sanctions uh, list or designation, repeatedly striking down, and, and the, uh, the, the uh, Courts here really um, supporting the listing by OFAC, uh, uh, the U.S. listing of of of, of the uh, um, uh, Al Qaeda uh, sanctions committee, the UN, and the UN again delisting because of the uh, problems uh, uh, 
caused by the lack of implementation thanks to the legal systems in Europe and the, and the successful implementation here. But that's, that's kind of an important issue and how far the legal systems will support and how, how they need to sort of um, adjust themselves to the reality of increasing terrorism and the havoc that it causes. Um, that's one thing. As far as the NATO is concerned, I would say uh, as long as uh, there is an <coughs> even contribution from the Europeans financially and as well as in terms of troops on the ground, <coughs> the US is really uh, so war weary right now. And, and if only 16,500 uh, non-US troops support uh, almost 125,000, 120,000 troops uh, like they did in Afghanistan, then there's gonna be a problem. There has to be some kind of a balance as far as money, as well as uh, blood is concerned. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Peter, well, no. Uh, Eric? I, I don't have anything else. Okay, uh, Professor Don Wallace, please. Yeah, actually, I would like to ask. Sure. Yeah. You can. Thanks. Um, many of you have been at many of these programs of Jonas, and you know how impressive they are. It's amazing how much information spews forth. Um, I really want to put something to Mr. Harris. Uh, first, the title. You know, this is about Europe and then these elections and what is the implication for political, social, economic security matters. Uh, I think I agree with him. I think Europe has been an enormous success. And not only that, I think his, he, Mr. Harris, is almost an emblem of that success. And I mean that. And I have an English conservative wife. He's a laborite, et cetera, and so forth. So you hope Scotland doesn't get the win. Um, but I think it would be fabulous for the Tories. It's sort of a joke. You know, the Labour Party gets about 70 seats in Scotland. That'll, you'd have a permanent Tory majority, probably, in, in England, Wales, it's, unless Wales breaks away. Then probably there'd be a few more Tory seats. Uh, but I really have, um, and putting aside all of the things that are happening today, because you obviously take the long view. I think that's the only view you can take what happens from day to day in national elections, national in countries, even the impact of uh, Amit's point about Al-Qaeda and all that. In a way, subspecies eternitatis, it's just kind of a blip. Really, I if you accept that the, the last 60 years of Europe are in a sense the evolution of four or 500 years. And I guess my question is really this. Americans have been torn about Europe. Uh, we're for Europe. We had a great deal to do, quite frankly, I think if you have the long view and forget what's like in Washington today, I think you can credit the United States essentially with the creation of Europe in many ways. The Europeans don't say that to you. They don't want to they don't want to admit it, but I think it's true. So we've always been we wanted Europe, and not just as a counterweight to the Soviet Union. I think we believed in it. I mean most Americans until at that time were most many of them were of European origin, etc. Blah, 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 blah. I guess the question arises, and except when the French were acting up. When the French said we want an independent foreign policy, a defense policy, the European Defense Unit, when the British you know, were asleep for a while and de Gaulle was very nasty about them, um, I think Americans did not like that. They get annoyed by the French, and then they remember that Lafayette was a friend of ours. So I think on balance, though, we want a strong Europe. And I guess my question is to you, Will there be such a strong Europe? And that's why I quoted de Gaulle in the beginning. You know, de Gaulle once said there can be two Europes, the United States of Europe, and that was sort of the image we also shared that certainly Lisbon, well, that the, that the, that the Eurocrats in Brussels certainly believe in, and many Europeans, a United States of Europe. And in fact, Mr. Harris compared in many ways the various elections to Juncker and the blah, 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 to the Senate versus the House, the Council versus the, you know, the Parliament, et cetera, and so forth. Do, do you honestly believe today that such a United States of Europe will em eventually develop? And these recent elections, of course, are indicative of something. Uh, or, as de Gaulle said, uh, maybe we just have a united Europe of states. You know, that kind of a Europe would make a Turkey more acceptable, you see, because it would be just part of a greater market. And, uh, and the other thing is, this sort of, you know, in the United States, in our constitutional system, the courts tend to respect what we call one voice in foreign affairs. And it, it has many, it, it comes up in many different cases. One voice, and in, notwithstanding the, and I'm a Republican, the execrable behavior of the, some of the House Republicans, we still tend to speak with one voice. Now that one voice, say over Iran, has to, has to somehow handle the Congress. Do you think that, and it's a question really to you, 
uh, will you have a United States of Europe someday or will you have to settle for a United States of Europe? And in any case, and putting this Ashton and all to one side, I think it's done well, will there be a single European foreign policy or will inevitably, as you said yourself, uh, people will look to the UK or France or whatever, depending on Germany, depending on the issue. I just like you sort of, and you can speak either personally or in your official capacity. Are you prepared to look into a crystal ball and give us your answer to those questions? Thanks. Well, um, with regard to the United States speaking with one voice, uh, it is interesting you say this, that, that uh, uh, and certainly in terms of national pride, believe in the American way of life. I'm struck by the fact that even in a great one, the poor guy on the street and the richest guy, you share this approach, and that, that is the United States. Uh, that's a wonderful thing. Uh, but I mean, the functioning of democracy in the United States Is we have many, many more political parties, a more complex political system. I'm not suggesting everything's fine, but the contrast. Uh, 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 so, so basically, we have many parties challenging the whole structure. Here, everybody shares the belief in the structure, but but somehow uh, it, it's grinding in, in in what, from a European perspective, is a worrying uh, direction. And, and I say it's not a question of debate here, the position in the Middle East but a debate about Israeli policy, about the Gaza terrorism, how to deal with Hamas, some wide-ranging debate is needed. I mean, uh, so, so it's not, and, and that appears to be absent, and, and, and that just would be uh, something that worries me a bit. But anyway, I'll go through your question backwards. Uh, st I started there. What do you say about enlargement? Now, many people in, in, in Washington would say, well, the EU should enlarge, Turkey should be a member. Personally, can can understand that point of view. However, uh, it, it, it is it is a view which has not got that much support in the European Union itself. The idea of Turkey joining is not just a question of Turkish workers and xenophobia and things of that kind. There are fundamental issues about the functioning of the state of Turkey. I know it's a founder member of NATO, many and a wonderful country. I had a lot to, to do with it, uh, but it is uh, by no means. Uh, anywhere near being ready to join uh, the European Union. I heard the other day uh, around here one of the think tanks who said, well, maybe to solve the problems in Bosnia at the present time, a very chronic, dangerous situation, the EU should loosen the criteria. So, 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 so I mean, again, I don't, thi I don't think that kind of approach uh, pushing Europe down a direction which actually would just water the whole thing down and make it even more challenging to work, not to say uh, unworkable. Now, your basic question, will there be a United States of Europe? Uh, the words themselves lend themselves to a profound misunderstanding. It is a European Union. It is based on a double legitimacy structure, the, 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 the supranational legitimacy of the European Parliament, of the Court of Justice, which is there above the states, obliging the member states of the European Union, different from the Council of Europe, uh, obliging the member states to, to live within a set of laws. Uh, uh, that, that exists, but the role of the states is also reflected uh, in the makeup of the Commission, in the existence of, of the European Council, and this kind of power sharing, you say it's complicated, it's messy, you could say it's sophisticated, as a matter of uh, Europe, that is what it is going to be. So uh, beyond that, you do hear people say, well, instead of this fits and candidat and stuff, we should elect the President of the European Commission. As I said, since the European Commission is not the most powerful institution in the European Union, in my personal opinion, it's a council and the parliament together, if you like, uh, which is, a, is, the, is, is the central uh, power-making uh, authority. Uh, 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 I don't think the, 
that idea is going to change things up very far. So I would think we're going to live through a period of consolidation in the constitutional sense. It is possible. Uh, it is certainly being discussed of whether there should be a more integrated political structure for the Eurozone, and that would then solve Britain's problems because they could be on the outside. Uh, but uh, if it is to relegate Britain, uh, let alone other non-Euro countries, to kind of second-class status, then it just won't work. Yeah? So uh, I, I would say I don't think the United States of Europe is going to exist. What I would say, however, is since you mentioned it's been ar around a while by definition, uh, uh, when the parliament was first elected in 1979, it actually didn't have any powers. And there was a club of members led by an idealistic Italian uh, former communist federalist, Mr. Spinelli, and he slowly but surely convinced the members of the European Parliament to table a draft treaty on the European Union, a total leap of faith. I'm very happy to have contributed to this project, precisely at the time when my party were campaigning to leave the whole thing. <laughs> I thought I would align myself with a slightly more inspiring approach. Uh, Francois Mitterrand then came around and said, well, I'm in favor of the European Union, having a European Union as well. And then circumstances changed, the, the law package, the single, Mrs. Sasha herself agreed to the single market, overlooking the fact it's difficult to have a single market without a single currency, a whole lot of uh, uh, processes uh, came in, 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 in to work uh, uh, and led to, to the foundation of the European Union, which was primarily the end of the Cold War. Uh, so uh, I think it's going to be a period of consolidation. But there are some question marks. One is a question over Britain. We'll see if I turn out to be too complacent. Uh, but another question mark uh, is Germany. Germany is now, for various reasons, it's not necessarily their fault, the dominant power. So the decisions which are made in Germany are all very important. So as I say, you could look at it in terms of sordid politics between the SPD and the CDU to arrange between Mr. Schulz and Mr. Juncker. You can look at it in that way. You could also say, well, fair enough, that's true. On the other hand, Germany is the largest economy at this moment in time. Britain has now begun to overtake them in 40 years, but there we are now. Uh, uh, and therefore, uh, cementing Germany in this leadership role is not by any means the worst of the scenarios since Germany is basically committed to the idea of a stronger political integration. Now, whether you get a single foreign policy, I would say that is something which is uh, developing. It depends on the challenges. I think the countries are well aware of their limitations when acting by themselves. Uh, unfortunately, there is not much enthusiasm for increased uh, military expenditure, which could be justified. Indeed, has been decided. Uh, that, uh, uh, but so, so I, uh, I, it, it is an incremental process. Baroness Ashton's job was to set up a structure, uh, a structure which didn't exist, uh, and, and it's a, a structure which is beginning uh, to function. And uh, I say, if, if the EU has responded slow, slowly to the Ukraine crisis, I don't think that's because of institutional mechanisms. It's because of hesitation, even my public opinion. Uh, in, in a civilized Western Europe, it takes a long time to realize that we're actually dealing with. Uh, in Cyprus, as the British ambassador described them the other day, or barbarians, whatever you want to use, you know, or shall we say, a, a real and present danger to the security of, of, of Europeans. So, uh, uh, and I say, if I get back to where you started, <laughs> namely the American sponsorship of this, uh, that, that of course is another long story. Um, uh, and certainly, uh, the European Union wouldn't exist without there having been a Marshall Plan, NATO, and there's no doubt about that. Uh, and indeed, uh, I was listening to a very prestigious and thoughtful German uh, who works here in one of the think tanks and explaining uh, how things are going uh, in Germany uh, and referring to the NSA, CIA scandals and saying that this was the dominant issue and it overshadowed everything else. Now that, I would say, is a great pity. It may be a reality, I don't know. But it's a great pity if the new generation of Germans aren't aware of how Germany came to be reunified aren't aware how uh, the history of West Germany, how it was defended. They don't know what the Berlin airlift is. That's a question I mean, of political leadership. And at the moment, the guy with a vision of history and a strategy and military muscle to back it up up to a point is Putin. So it's a question of finding the, the answer. And I'm not so sort of complacent about it, but I don't actually think Europeans have much choice uh, beyond uh, 
consolidating the European Union and making it a, as one of the best that they can be and bringing back the trust of the citizens. Finally, I don't know if you've got you switch your computer off now, but the Eurobarometer have published in a poll following all the shenanigans over Juncker and so and apparently the, the citizens seem to have more confidence in the institutions of the European Union than they did a few months ago. So whether that <laughs> means anything, I have the faintest idea. Thanks a lot. Thank you for well, the academic uh, clock is ticking very fast, but not the academic dialogue. We will let it continue. I know some of you have to leave, but I need two minutes of your time. Sharon, would you come up here for a second, please? Uh, Sharon is coordinating the internship program, and uh, we we have uh, members of the generation of change right here. And uh, would you call those who are supposed to get first their certificate, uh, completing the research on terrorism this summer? Would you call them and yes, one at a time? I'd like to thank our summer 2014 interns. They help contribute to Professor Alexander's projects. Not only with this event, but many of his other projects. We have three graduating today. They're finishing their program. Can I have Frank, Sono, and Andrew please come up? Where is this certificate? And we will be presenting them a certificate for their completion of this program. So give us a bit this more. is for Frank, can I have you come up first? Sure. This is his certificate. Okay, congratulations. Thank you very much. Okay. You have to mention the school. Okay. And also, Andrew. Congratulations, okay. And then I'd also like to briefly introduce our interns, so if everyone can come up. <laughs> the rest of the interns, if you could please briefly introduce yourself. Right here. Sonam Burke, University of Pacific. I study international relations. Hi, uh, Andrew Dubois. I go to Trinity University in San Antonio, Texas, and I'm a Middle Eastern Studies and a History major. Hi, I'm Frank Randall, and I go to St. Francis College in New York City, and I am double majoring in History and Political Science. Hi, I'm Avi Oskanan. I'm a communication major at the University of Maryland. My name is Stephanie Emerson. I study political science at the University of Chicago. My name is Reed Woodrum, and I study public policy at Princeton University in Princeton, New Jersey. Hi, I'm uh, Uri Lerner. I just finished a uh, master's in U.S. foreign policy at American University. Okay, that's the next generation of scholars. So thank you again for coming and we'll continue the dialogue in the coming days. All the best.